Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. We appreciate you joining us on this Friday lunch hour. We are credentialed by the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners, as well as by the Alabama Board of Nursing Practitioners to create and offer and offer to you contact hours. Each of the hours that we choose, or most of the hours that we choose to do, are suggested by you. Uh, so there's an evaluation process to what we do, and in it we ask for suggestions for uh, future topics. And today's topic was suggested by a former attendee, and today's topic is the NASW, which is the National Association of Social Workers, Code of Ethics. So today we will go through the Code of Ethics uh, with you, uh, and hopefully uh, it will be something that uh, will enrich your practice. If you're of another uh, clinical background, such as nursing, uh, do know that today's uh, presentation is, is related to specifically social work, but if you choose to participate, we hope it is informative. Those of you who are new to us, uh, may not know who we are, who Care Patrol is. We are an aging care navigation firm. And in the past, uh, and you may know this under other terms, such as a placement agency, uh, what we do primarily and, and why we do these CEUs is, is our commitment to educating folks. And that's primarily what we do when clients come our way. We let them know what is next potentially in their wellness journey. And we help them along that way, providing resources for legal, financial, uh, you know, other, other arenas, as well as uh, if needed, helping them to locate and uh, find a provider to come into their home or to move to a community. And when they move to a community, then we are paid. That's how our service works. We're a little bit like, a realtor for assisted living. And we're only paid when someone moves. But don't let that dissuade you from referring to us because about 60% of the people that we engage with do not move into communities and we are not paid. But our goal again is to educate. And if we can educate your clients in ways that may be meaningful to them, we'd love to have the opportunity. We've still got people coming in. Uh, and let's get into some housekeeping though, however. Uh, again, we're accredited by the Board of Nursing Practitioners and Social Work Examiners for the state of Alabama. This uh, unit is considered live for social workers because we have a password protection system for the evaluation. Those of you who've been with us and are in your car or on your phone or otherwise away from your screen, I'm gonna to read to you now the uh, evaluation link. Uh, and that link is, and it's a SurveyMonkey app, and the link is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r, forward slash, the number two, and then all uppercase letters with some numbers, X, L, K, five, J, nine. I've posted this into the chat room for those of you who may have just be joining, you should be able to see it there now. Uh, and I'll read it again. We still have people coming in. So I'll read one more time uh, and I'll read it at the end as well, but I'll read one more time now the evaluation link. It is https colon forward slash forward slash 
www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash two uppercase x uppercase l uppercase k five uppercase j nine it's password protected. We'll give the password out at the end. And I always look to be reminded and we encourage your discussion and participation. In fact, you have the ability to unmute your mics if you care to join the discussion or you have the ability to use the chat room. I know I see some new names today. You may be new to Zoom if you are and you want to know how to um, uh, get uh uh excuse me i'm i can't do two things at once y'all i apologize we'll give the evaluation password out at the end if someone's always kind enough to remind me you must complete the evaluation to receive a contact hour we upload certificates uh for nursing hours but social workers load your own you'll all get a certificate and an email uh as well as this presentation so I was starting to say before I confused myself that we encourage your discussion or you're either through the chat room or with your own voice. And I will tell you that each of us on this call is enriched when you add your voice to mine. I encourage you to discuss things with us. If you want to know how and you're new to Zoom, as I was saying, there are some new folks here and you're not familiar with Zoom and you want to find your chat room or unmute, Move your cursor to the top of your screen or to the bottom. At one or the other, a bar will pop down or up. And on that bar is written the word chat. Click on that for the chat room. On that same bar is a, an icon for a microphone. Click on that to talk. We do encourage it. And we appreciate you again for being here today. We have for this topic, again, suggested by one of you from a previous uh, course, is the NASW Code of Ethics. Uh, and we have three objectives that we hope to meet. This, this is, Ms. Hunter, it's asking if this is an ethics presentation. It is, um, and it is live, exactly. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the, uh, the objectives are to list the primary mission and defining feature of social work. I think this course today may be a 101 for many of you social workers, if that's the case. I do apologize, but hey, on the plus side, it's an ethics course. Um, that we're going to list at least three of the six ethical principles from that code of ethics and what each of those means. And then we're going to discuss the professional review process. And this is my attempt and my hope to bring you something new in addition to maybe rehashing information that is not so new uh, in terms of giving you tools. And so our goal, in addition to meeting your needs with these CEUs and offering topics of your choosing, our goal is to also uh, try and leave you with a set of tools and resources because you're only as good as your tools. Anyone who's done any sort of home repair knows that. You cannot use a, uh, a, a Phillips head screwdriver on a flathead screw. Uh, so we hope that you gain something today and it'll be my very great effort to see that you do. So as I said, I like to see you discuss things. And so I'd like to know, and you can unmute and discuss, or you can use the chat room, to whom on this call does the NASW Code of Ethics apply? To whom on this call does the NASW Code of Ethics apply? Social work. Thank you, Kaylee. Social work, everyone, but everyone, thank you, Ms. Smith, everyone, but specifically social workers. Now, you all, I'm sure, know that in the state of Alabama, the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners does not provide a code of ethics. Instead, it points us to the NASW code of ethics. Hence, the reason we're discussing that today. And that code of ethics, like 
any other code of ethics, including those for you nurses, would have as its intent to offer values, principles, and standards to guide your decision-making and your conduct in your everyday lives and encounters with clients and patients. It's relevant to all social workers and social work students, regardless of the setting in which they work. And it is to be used by the individuals and agencies uh, that employ them and that choose to use it as their own. In this case, it would be the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners. The 2021 update included language that addressed the importance of self-care. Now, you all may remember that we had Dr. Chandler Caldwell address that topic for us last spring or summer. Uh, and we've tried to, in most every month or every other month, include self-care in what we offer to teach. And the reason is this, if you all fall, the rest of us fall with you. So we have to keep you propped up, right? And self-care is important. And I do want you, if that's an important topic to you, to tune in again with us. It's a large document, as you probably know, the Code of Ethics. And so I wanted to break it down into bite-sized sort of pieces, and, and again, sort of basic pieces, but things that I think may be worthy of review for you. So the, the preamble, which is obviously the first section, just summarizes the, the code and its applications. And it says to us that the primary mission of social work is to enhance human well-being and meet the basic needs of all people and to empower those people, particularly those who are vulnerable, such as the poor and the oppressed, the disenfranchised, those who are living in untenable situations. Historically, the defining feature of social work and of each of you is a focus both on the individual well being of your client and the social context in which they live and the well being of the society in which they live, which is in direct proportion in some ways to your work with the client. And fundamental to this is knowledge of the environmental forces that create problems for clients, including those that are at work in our society and, and perhaps beyond our control. So social workers are also uh, urged, let's say, in the Code of Ethics to promote social justice and change on behalf of their clients. And clients could be anyone that is within your scope. This doesn't mean it's limited to an individual patient whom you're seeing. It extends, as we all extend, beyond an individual. There are all of the people that that individual touches, which thus influences our community. And being aware of community, we have to be sensitive to cultural diversity and ethnic diversity uh, and work to bridge those gaps and other forms of social injustice. And we do so, or you do so, I'm not a social worker, y'all. You do so through direct practice and through work in the community, or you may choose to do it in an administrative role. You may be an advocate. You may be someone who attends protest, or you may be someone who is a research hound. However, you can affect social change. That is your task and your charge by the NASW Code of Ethics. And the goal of this work is to enable the people you serve to be able to address their own needs. We still have folks coming in, y'all. I'm sorry I get distracted. So what are the purposes then? We've seen the preamble. We've seen the urge and the charge that you have to 
extend yourselves. What are the purposes then of the code of ethics? You can unmute, you can offer your voice. Again, I'd love to hear your voices on this call because your voice matters and it matters in many ways in this topic, much more than mine. And I hope you have uh, the inclination, some of you to share that voice. The the purpose of the code of ethics is to help all of us have a better view on what our job is and what our purpose is and help us understand the right way we should conduct ourselves as professional social workers. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer you now, thank you for your comment, I, I didn't catch your name, a, a standing uh, offer, and this goes for all of you, should you ever wish to lecture in this forum, please do, please let me know, whomever just spoke said much more eloquently what I've said, and I would love to hear that sort of voice coming to us. Oh, is that, Ms. Smith, was that you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your voice and for your work. So the code of ethics serves six purposes. Um, and it, it, those purposes are essentially the core values on which the social work mission is based. And as social workers, you have an obligation to be able to articulate these values, principle, and standards. Again, without regard to the setting in which you practice. These are broad ethical principles. They should guide your social work practice. And we'll discuss a little later what to do in the event of uh, much more nuanced differences. So the six purposes are, one is that we identify the core values of the social work mission. Two is to summarize broad ethical principles that reflect those core values and the standards used to guide social work practice. The third uh, purpose of the code of ethics is to help you identify considerations when obligations conflict or when you are uncertain of your ethical duty. It provides general standards that we, me, the non-social worker, the public can hold accountable for you, hold you accountable by, I should say, and the profession itself. And it socializes those who are new to the profession in the values and ethical principles and standards and practices that are expected, including ongoing education. Make note of that. It's not just that you have to satisfy uh, the, you know, the contact hours to renew your license. In the eyes of the Code of Ethics, you are also charged with continually educating yourself and adding to your toolbox and encouraging others to do so. Uh, and then lastly, the purpose of the code of ethics is to allow you and, and the profession as a whole to determine whether an individual social worker has engaged in ethical conflict or unethical conduct, and then put into motion a set of formal procedures that would address that. And here's the catch. By subscribing to this code of ethics, which you do as a member of the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners, in subscribing to this code, you are required to cooperate in any kind of proceedings the NASW may bring against you, and you are to abide by their ruling. So can you name anybody? Can you name any of the code of ethical principle, code of ethics principles, excuse me? Can you name any of the NASW code of ethics principles? So this may be a good review for you all. 
Um, I, I'm glad it is. So the mission of social work is rooted in these core values that have been embraced by social workers throughout the history of the profession. And they are unique to and the foundation for social work, service, social justice, dignity, human relationships, integrity, and competence. And this constellation of values is unique to social work. Each of you know this to be true. The values and principles that flow from these, however, you as an individual must balance against the complexity of the human experience and your practice. So these are touchstones for you, and yet you will still find yourself in dilemma at times. So the, the core values then we've discussed, let's get deeper into them, service according to the code of ethics is the primary goal of social work, okay? The primary goal of social work is to help people in need and to address social problems, service. Social workers should elevate others and service of others above your own self-interest. Now, I will say, though I'm not a social worker, this is the code I hold myself and my employees to at Care Patrol. We hold ourselves beneath the service of others. And you're encouraged, get this, you're encouraged to volunteer some portion of your skills in a pro bono, meaning free, uh, expectation. Uh, or it may be a trade expectation. But in other words, you're encouraged to volunteer. And this may mean that you participate in a march or a walk. It may mean that you uh, call bingo at a nursing home. It could mean any number of things. It could mean that you bring your service animal into the hospital. How, wh whatever it means, this is expected, expected of social workers. Social justice is expected of social workers. And the challenge to social injustice is written into the fabric of social work particularly when we are talking about the vulnerable and the oppressed among us. So especially when you are looking at issues of social justice, you are to keep my, in mind or keep at the front of your mind rather, poverty, unemployment and discrimination. In valuing the dignity of someone and the worth of someone, this is again, an expectation of you as social workers. You are to respect someone's inherent dignity. You are to, you are to treat each person the same and in a caring manner and caring would be inclusive of keeping in mind cultural and ethnic diversity. And so you should be both beholden to each person as an individual with worth and dignity, and then to society at large, which is composed of unique individuals, each of whom has inherent worth and dignity. Now, one of the ways in which might be a nuance uh, uh, way of, um, you know, dis discriminating without intending could be what are called microaggressions. Is anyone familiar with the term or the, the notion of a microaggression? You can add to the chat room if you have a definition. I'm sure others would love it. But my understanding of a microaggression would be saying something along the lines of, I'll give you an example. Sometimes white folks think that black folks know other black folks because they're black. 
And so if a white social worker were to ask a client who was black, if that client knew someone else at random without intending that white social worker who was trying to make conversation would in fact be placing distance between herself or himself and the client by bringing into the discussion something that does not naturally belong there, which is our differences. Behold our differences. That does not belong in that discussion. We seek to find common ground, but it can be issues like that that are unplanned and not malicious in intent that still have a negative impact on the listener. And so we have to be aware of things like this. Now, the importance of human relationships, again, social workers must embrace because again, we're starting with the individual, we're moving into larger society and the relationships that form that society. So we value the importance of those relationships and we engage others in relationships to assist, to make a purposeful effort to assist us or you, the social worker in making a difference in the world. Integrity as a value simply means that you tell the truth and that you behave trustworthy in a trustworthy way. Um, and this would be um, that you are also truthful in your allegiance to your profession, to this code of ethics, and to your employer. So all of which may have different ethical standards, you're to weigh those out in a trustworthy and truthful manner and pursuit. And then the value of competence would be illustrated by each of you taking the time today to um, educate yourselves. So you're, you're in many ways, I think, meeting that standard and I know that you apply other things that you learn along the way into your practice. And so long as you continue to do that, you achieve competence. Ms. King says, we in the blind community encounter this quite often as well. Ms. King, that's so interesting. We had a CEU, I guess, I'm not sure when now, maybe in the spring or fall, uh, with a, a gentleman from the Talladega Institute of Deaf and Blind, who was a DJ. And, and he shared with us over the course of an hour, uh, the various issues of, of, of ethical treatment of, of folks who are blind. And one of the things he said that was most, uh, I think, informative for, for those of you on the call who are clinicians, was that when you are blind and you are in a doctor's office waiting room or an emergency room waiting room, or even in a patient room, it's evident to you from where the voice is coming. Even though you cannot see it, you know that the people who are addressing your issues and needs are actually talking to the person beside you and not to you. And for him, th this was most, most frustrating. And I don't know if you've encountered that, Ms. King, and, and you may corroborate that or not, but I appreciate you for being courageous in putting your hand up and identifying yourself as someone who has met with discrimination. There are responsibilities. I think we've been very clear that you have a responsibility to this code of ethics. And even then, this code of ethics does not prescribe how you should act as a person and a social worker in all situations. It can't. You have to take into account the tenets of social work and make an understanding of the world in which this person lives, in which uh, they interact and the possibility of conflicts along the way, and then balance those against your ethical values, codes, and standards. Um, 
ethical responsibilities flow from our relationships. We, by the nature of being human, and you, by the nature of being human and a social worker, have responsibility ethically in every relationship you have on a human level. So let's switch gears and move away from what the code identifies as core principles values and move to a tool set. What process exists if you come to your office on Monday and you find that you've received a letter of complaint from the NASW Code of Ethics? What do you do? Does anyone know? Uh, and again, I, I love it when you speak, and, and I think you all know that, that you'd rather hear yourselves than me. Uh, oh, and, and by that, on that note, my camera's not working, y'all. I don't know why. So not that anybody misses seeing me, but, but if someone did, I'm sorry, it's not working. So what process exists if you receive a complaint about you and, and an ethical breach? So if you receive this letter, and it will be a letter from the uh, Professional Review uh, Office of Ethics and Professional Review from the NASW, then um, don't panic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Don't panic. Um, instead, uh, what you need to do are a set of steps that we will address in just a moment. So let us then point out here, and we will point out again, when you come to issues in which you are concerned about the ethics of a decision that you must make. If you come to that point, add to your decision tree this. Whatever you do, think about how it might be judged by your peers if a complaint were someday lodged. So whatever you do, how would it look in terms or in front of an ethics review board? That is one of the ways, and maybe the most telling way uh, that you can, when confronted with very nuanced and complex issues, then think to yourself, okay, I could really possibly be brought up for review depending on what decision I make. So how would it look if that were the case? How can, I, how can I make a decision that would meet the standards of making a good decision, even if it was the wrong decision? I have a question. My name's yes, Katrina. My name's Katrina. Um, when it comes to that, because while following the code of ethics, Sometimes it gets a little sticky because you have clients and you have a code, so you gotta try to make both of them fit together. Sometimes the code of ethics stops you from making the best decision for your client because it's a real world and everything is not all black, white, it's gray. And in between the client and what would be best for the client and following the code of ethics, sometimes it's a gray area. And I face that a lot. So how would you suggest that we deal with those gray areas? Like the code of ethics says this, the code of ethics says this, but at the same time, my client is going through this. And if I do that, it's going to make his situation worse. So how do we deal with those type of moments? Well, we, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, but the, the gist of it really is documentation. So remember I said that, that when you make a decision, like the ones that you, you brought up that, that face you, I'm sure near, nearly daily, when you are in that situation, think about how it would look from the outside. And when you do that, remember 
that you may still make the wrong decision, but so long as you stay true to your integrity and document, then you really should be fine if you were brought against a peer review. The key is in documenting what you are doing and why you are doing it. And even if perhaps acknowledging your knowledge that it was wrong. And then if you still felt strongly about it, you could self-report. And generally when you self-report and have followed that documentation trail as to why you made a decision, that generally is not brought before a hearing. Does that help? And Mr. Jones, Melvin Jones said you consult a lawyer, which may be true. We'll talk about that in a moment. Ms. Williams says, if you have questions in making those decisions, and he, this is a great point, Ms. Williams, thank you. You can always consult with other social workers for guidance or opinions. And there are about a hundred on this call you could call. Now you may be working in loan. Uh, I know many social workers are the, the only social worker in their agency or office. Uh, and so it may be harder for you to reach out to others. But I think that's a terrific point, Ms. Williams. Thank you for raising that. The good news is that very few social workers are ever brought before an ethics related complaint or lawsuit and even fewer of those ever go to court uh, in the criminal court. Uh, so the evidence of this, and you all can search your own wallets, is that your annual premium for malpractice as a social worker is lower than other clinical, uh, you know, other clinicians are. Um, and that's because very few cases are brought. Um, so social workers who are disciplined and brought before an ethics review are those who are doing things like sex with a client, falsifying documents or documentation, um, disclosing confidential information without authorization. That's a big one. And of course, that's a big concern for, for all of you. Um, committing financial fraud, terminating unethically services to a client. And we'll talk about that. Uh, entering into business with a client, lying about CEUs, and there's no need to lie. We've got 70 on YouTube and we do six a month. So, and there are others, there are plenty of others in the market who do them as well. Um, and then there are providing services that are really outside the scope of what you do and still doing that negligently. So if you are a social worker who decided to build ramps uh, for people and you built really bad ramps that fell in, you could be liable as a social worker. And then failing to document. So documentation comes up about three times here, as you can see. So do complaints of ethical abuse against a social worker, do they ever go to court? Do complaints of ethical abuse go to court? Have you, this is a better question, have you individually, you on this call, known of any complaint of ethical abuse against a peer go before the court? Have you known this to occur in our state? Ms. Smith says no. Mr. Evans says he would probably say so. I've never heard of it, says Ms. Sharp. Thank you. Thank you all. No, says Ms. Whiting. So, the professional review process, if criminal, thank you, Ms. Burrow, that's correct. Um, so the professional review process is, is, is one that is, seeks to promote an ethical practice, both for the individual and for the craft of social work. And again, it gives those outside of it um, the opportunity to hold social workers accountable. So it's a, it's a right of redress uh, for clients. So if you get that complaint, Georgia DF did years ago. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, so if you are asked or receive a letter of complaint, you're asked for a response. And what we want you to do, and this is how we protect ourselves, and this goes back to the question that was discussed earlier, what do we do in these cases? One, 
you be mindful of your thoughts and feelings and the thoughts and feelings of the person or client in question. You all remember we've done mindfulness many times in this uh, on these CEUs and mindfulness simply means that you are engaged in the present, that you are fully present, that you are not thinking about today or tomorrow or yesterday or anything but what's going on with you. You're mindful, you're present, you're engaged. So be mindful, learn about the PR process, professional review process, which, which we're going through today. Be honest in every communication that you make and respectful. Um, be prepared to go before a hearing or even court. So be emotionally and mentally prepared for that, even if it's a long shot, and defend yourself ethically. Most cases that go to professional review go through mediation. And if it doesn't clear mediation, if no solution can be found, then it may be referred to a hearing. This would be, in most cases, a civil hearing. Uh, and only those that are more serious, like sexual relations, would go directly to a hearing, not pass and go, not collecting a mediation process, straight to criminal court. If you were to ever receive a letter that stated that someone had lodged a complaint against you with the professional review board, you would have 14 days to respond. And your response then dictates to the intake committee for the NASW whether or not to even proceed with mediation. So along with the letter, should you ever receive it, and let's hope none of you do, should you receive the letter, you would get the statement from the complainant about the breaches. Um, you would get a copy of the procedures for review from the NASW. You would get a statement where the complainant had pledged confidentiality to the statement and thus was not discussing it outside of this hearing. Uh, and you would have forms that you would be asked to submit. Now, you may reach out to the NASW upon receipt of this letter and ask them to provide you with a free consultant who will help you then gather these forms, complete them, and return them within the 14 day period. This person would be a trained volunteer and their role would be to simply guide you through the process of your response. They are not attorneys, they cannot offer legal advice. And if you check and need an attorney, check your insurance and find out whether your liability policy will cover the legal fee okay, to defend your complaint. And even if it does, please note that the attorney will not be able to accompany you into the hearing or the mediation process. Um, they would not be allowed to be there. They can only prep you for that. And the reason really is, is that this is not intended to be a punitive process. This is not they're not gonna put you on a rack in the town square and leave you for three days. That's not the point. The point is corrective action for the sake of you and for the sake of the profession. So you may be sanctioned, you may have your license revoked or you may simply be removed from the NASW, um, but the goal is not to harm. Uh, the goal is to rehabilitate uh, in the real sense, let's say. So this response that you're, you're writing, perhaps with the help of a consultant, is, is not uh, designed to provide or produce evidence or prove the case or not. You're simply providing information that this committee, the intake committee, will use 
to decide whether or not to move forward. Um, now, if you receive a letter of complaint and you think, well, this is just doesn't even meet the criteria of an ethical breach, then simply state that in your response. Now, if you need to provide additional information, even if you make that statement, you, you may only do so, and it only applies if you, the social worker against who the complaint was lodged, were a member of the NASW at the time of the breach. And the complainant must have been directly affected. In other words, they were the client or maybe a family member who witnessed firsthand this issue about an ethical breach. Um, it must relate to at least one of the specific sections within, within the larger code of ethics, which is vast. Uh, and it must then also rise to the level of even needing to bother with, right? And then lastly, someone cannot lodge a complaint against you for something that happened two years ago. It would have to be uh, within one year. So one of us um, has a uh, issue, it seems, and there may be others who have other things to go to. So it's a bit early, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you one, the link again to the survey, and I'm typing into the uh, chat room, the code word for today's evaluation, which is a capital N, capital A, capital S, capital W. NASW is the password for today. And thank you for reminding me. I, I always say I'm, I'm blessed that someone is looking after me and reminds me to do what I'm supposed to do. Um, so if the complainant is acting on hearsay, they did not have direct knowledge, uh, make that argument in your, uh, in, in your response, um, and address any of the criteria, uh, around the complainant statement and counter each of those or allegations rather. Uh, if, if, if the situation warrants and presents itself. Uh, and here's an example. I did not breach the complainant's confidentiality as I had the client's permission. So now this intake committee is not going to determine who's true. They're really again going to decide, does this rise to the level of even needing to find out what's true? So it may go to mediation or it may go to a hearing. And so I want to ask you all then, how do you respond to a complaint of ethical abuse? How do you respond to a complaint about ethical abuse that is lodged against you? When completing your response, remember who you are. You have personal values and ethics, and you also have a second layer, which is your professional values and ethics, and your response must take into account both of those. Be clear, be concise, be professional, and be in your response non judgmental. Simply state what happened with as much neutrality as you can in your language. Focus on behaviors. Okay, what happened? What did the client do? What did you do? Um, and then do not disclose confidential information within this response unless it is necessary, specifically and very much so if it is mental health or sexual behavior or other confidential of a large nature. Do not, do not discuss this in your response. Um, it really is um, intended to state facts, but then just to, so that you know whatever you state and whatever you place in this document, it cannot then be used against you in a second court hearing by the client, say for whatever might be the case. This is not to be used as documentation or evidence in a court hearing of any type. I'm sorry, the uh, dogs are barking. 
Uh, so if a client issues a formal complaint, you may have concerns about their motivations, but you cannot abandon this client. Okay, under the code of ethics standard 1.17. So if you decide to terminate, you cannot abandon. If you decide to terminate, you have to offer referral and secure a referral to another social worker or professional in writing and provide documentation that you have done so uh, in the chart as well as in any other way that may be appropriate so that you can show, should you ever be brought up for review, that you did not abandon the client. Now, if you decide that you must continue to serve the client, you still want to document all of the alternatives you considered and why you chose to continue working with the client. So the question that uh, I think it was Ms. Bryant asked earlier was what do we do in these situations? Well, you document. If you decide to terminate because it's that kind of situation, just refer and document and why. If you keep the client, refer what the options were and why you decided to keep the client, even though there was some ethical gray area in the relationship. So if you wish, as I'd said earlier in that response, you may also self-report. And if you do, you would do so to your insurer as well. And you would check with your insurance to see what, if anything, needed to be reported. Clearly you would do that before reporting. Uh, and when you renew your insurance, just know that because there was a report, uh, you may likely get dinged on it. It certainly will show up. Uh, and then regarding your licensing body, which for you all, most of you I'm sure, is the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners, checking with them to see what they feel needs to be self-reported. Uh, and then, if you breach state laws and you know that you do, self-report. And always when you self-report, the review process will be easier on you for coming forward versus waiting for the complaint to be made. And again, it's typically not punitive. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, they're going to see if this rises to the level. And if you say to them, hey, man, I made a boo-boo, here it is, it likely will never go to it here. So that, that is the reason to self-report. So here's a guy, I'll read this, we're running sort of low on time. But so Daniel was a social worker. He was uh, working with a couple who was going through uh, planning possibly a divorce. The divorce did occur. And with the divorce came a child custody battle. And then as you might expect, things got ugly. The attorney representing the mother uh, subpoenaed Daniel, the social worker, for the records from the sessions with the couple. The records that Daniel gave were then used against the father in the custody battle who lost the custody battle. And after that, the father filed suit against Daniel and against the licensing board, uh, which was the NASW in this complaint. So what they found was, in response, is that Daniel had not reviewed the current code and he did not seek consultation. So when he received this letter, he didn't ask the NASW for help in completing the form. Now, he did, during the review process, acknowledge that he made a mistake. He acknowledged that he made a mistake and that he was confused about the difference between a subpoena and a court order. Do, do y'all know the difference in a subpoena and a court order, anybody? A subpoena is a court order. However, a subpoena is not issued by a judge. So judges issue many types of court orders, one of which is a subpoena. However, if you get an order to appear in court from a judge, you will be held in contempt of court and possibly go to jail if you do not go. 
With a subpoena, those same penalties are in front of you, and yet they're rarely enforced. Look at what's happening politically. How many times do, from either side of the aisle, do people you know, not respond to a congressional subpoena? And it's, and it's sort of really that you don't have to, in a way. Um, Mr. Evans has done uh, me a better job. Thank you, Mr. Evans. A subpoena is a court order to appear or provide some type of evidence needed for the court to make a ruling. What Daniel did not know is that he was not to release such records unless he had obtained the client's consent or issued a court order, in this case, not a subpoena. And in fact, the code requires you as social workers to challenge any subpoena unless the client gives consent or unless the judge orders you to turn over documentation. Let me say that again. The code of ethics for the NASW requires you to challenge a subpoena unless there is client consent or the judge himself or herself issues you an order to appear. And so what they found then was Daniel was, was, had long since graduated school before the NASW Code of Ethics was adopted. Therefore, he was not subject to it, right? That was one of the criteria you had to be a member of for this to take place. So other examples that may be more to home for y'all, let's say that you receive possibly an ethical complaint because of Facebook. So you may not have your privacy settings set that only your friends and family can see your post. It may be that one of your clients, unbeknownst to you, would stalk you on Facebook and really cause some real confusion around boundaries between you. Imagine if a client asked you about what you did on the weekend and knew what you did on the weekend. You might inadvertently forward an email to the wrong person that has HIPAA information in it. You might leave your office with HIPAA information face up and able to be seen by anyone who might enter. Or, and I don't know how this would be the case, but it was listed as an example in what I read, you might forget to document suicidal ideation, which I don't know how that could be, but it may be. Um, and so the standards of proof then that need to be met in any case um, that would be filed would be uh, the state licensing board, the NASW, a civil court of law, or criminal court. These are the four areas in which you would be required to meet the standards of proof that you had not violated an ethical uh, you know, uh, issue. And in criminal court, social workers in civil suits are presumed blameless until proved otherwise. In civil suits, um, the standard of proof is just a preponderance of evidence. OK, whereas that would also be the same standard by which the ABSWE and the NASW would rate you would be preponderance of evidence. But if you went to criminal court, there are stricter standards. It's not a preponderance of evidence. It is that there is no reasonable doubt that you committed something. OK, so here's the difference in the OJ trial many years ago. If any of you, any of you are old enough to remember, OJ was found uh not guilty in the criminal proceeding because there was no there was there was a, an element of doubt right there was it was not no reasonable doubt there was an element of doubt in the criminal proceeding in the civil proceeding where that was not as high of a standard i mean they you know won millions of dollars against him in the civil suit because all they had to do was show if a and b and c and d and e are true then you know g must be true too but in, you know, criminally, you say A, B, D, C, E, F, N, G are true, and that is beyond. So in complaints, uh, we have to see that in lawsuits, it, it's a legal duty. You're derelict in that duty. Your client suffered harm or injury 
and that was a, a direct cause of your treatment. Licensing boards don't require that kind of evidence, uh, and they can still sanction regardless. Um, now, they talk a little bit about impairment. These are reasons to self uh, uh, self report uh, or reasons to report in your workplace. So if anyone is providing flawed or inferior services, sexually involved, addicted, has mental illness, these are things that we need to be looking for and also empathetic to, as well as aware of in terms of an ethics breach. But we have to make allowance for our co-workers to live in the world in which we live and face environmental stress, to have inadequate training, or to have personal stress and show grace. Prevention strategies basically document, tell the truth, uh, don't make silly mistakes like forwarding emails. Um, and I know we're out of time. Let's finish with social workers should take into consideration all the values, principles, and standards in the NASW Code of Ethics and hold those relevant to any situation in which ethical judgment is warranted. Social workers' decisions and actions should be consistent with the spirit as well as the letter of the Code of Ethics. That's today's uh, CEU. I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry we ran over. Have a great weekend. And on Monday, we'll have Bill Nolan and Pamela Strickland answering your questions on Medicaid. These were questions submitted throughout the month. Some very detailed and inter interesting questions. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you on Monday. You can always go to carepatrol.com, look for an advisor in your Alabama area code. My picture will come up and you click on that, scroll down to register. Um, and then uh, I'll be sending out a letter soon, an email with our March calendar. We've got some good things coming up in March. So thank y'all for what you do. Uh, and uh, if anyone needs to survey monkey, I'll type it in again. It's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash 2XLK5J9. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for staying late. Again, I hope you join us Monday. I hope you have a great weekend. And thanks again.